Hello, BookTube. All right, we're back for part three of my Columbus Day Q&A. Sorry, it's part three. I had no idea there were this many questions. Uh, where I'm answering questions to, to while away the time on Columbus Day when there's no mail. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're, we're just going to barrel on here and try and get this done in three videos. Uh, Will Sullivan asks, uh, what comics have you been picking up lately? Any thoughts on Marvel Legacy? Uh, as far as comics that I've been picking up regularly, I don't, I'm not currently buying any monthly comics except for Boom Studios, uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and Go Go Power Rangers, which I, I, Go Go Power Rangers especially is just started. It's on, I guess, you five or six, and I love it. I just absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, but I, no, no, uh, right at the moment, no company comics from DC or Marvel. Although every week I will buy whatever graphic novels come out that are of interest, whatever collections or hardcovers or whatever. I, though, I, I am a foremost customer of those uh, because I know that I'm going to go back to those. I know that I'm going to read them over and over again. I know, in other words, they're going to be worth the money. I'm not gonna, there's not going to be a pile of single issues that I never look at again. Uh, but as far as Marvel, Marvel Legacy though, goes, those of you who might not be up on Marvel Comics, in, uh, in the last three or four or five years, Marvel Comics has completely revamped their marquee characters, uh, changing their identities, changing their ethnicities, their, their genders, their ages, so that the Marvel Comics characters that you might just dimly remember if you don't follow comics, such as the Incredible Hulk or Thor or Iron Man, uh, are radically different. If you were to look at the comics, uh, the Incredible Hulk is a, a teenage Asian boy who likes being the Hulk. It's not a tragedy for him. He enjoys it. It's cool. Uh, Iron Man is a, is a young black woman, uh, and Tony Stark is in a coma or missing. <laughs> uh, Thor is is a woman, the long the long time Thor supporting character, uh, Jane Foster, who has the power of Thor, ha uses the hammer, and for some unknown reason, the folks at Marvel Comics decided that the name Thor was a title, was was a, a code name like Batman. <laughs> it isn't. Of course, the character of Thor was given that name when he was born. He's, he is Thor. It's not you can't become Thor. You can gain his powers, but uh, that's been true for years now. The, the, the X Men, the Fantastic Four, the the, uh, the the Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, uh, uh, to a large extent, Spider Man. They, these things have all become drastically shifted. Uh, and Marvel Legacy is a company wide. Uh, it was billed anyway as a company wide gesture at fixing that, at returning these characters to their uh, recognizable, traditional incarnations. Uh, and it's only just started. I, I uh, read the first issue, but it was, you know, the, the one shot was, it wasn't, it wasn't actually an issue. It wasn't a launch of anything. And I, I've heard all sorts of rumors that lead me to wonder whether or not the, the Marvel Comics powers that be uh, have the integrity of their word. I, I don't I don't trust them, in other words, to, to do what the billing of Legacy is, which is to return all these these canonical characters. I don't trust that that's going to happen. So we'll see, I, I guess is my question. I haven't, I haven't, uh, I have no firm opinion on Legacy other than we'll see. <laughs> uh, it's not really going to affect me because I, I don't think I'm going to be reading any of the issues anyway in a month-to-month -month basis or week-to-week -week basis. Uh, uh, let's see here. Valentina Garcia, hello, uh, says, when did you decide to become a book critic? Have you ever thought of having your own publishing company? I would certainly under no circumstances have my own publishing company. Uh, but I, I first decided to become a book critic when I saw the book critics at the newspaper where I worked in action. And I, I knew and liked and hung out with the, their boss, the, the, the art section editor. Uh, and I loved reading. So I, I thought these things go together and tried writing some book reviews for him. And it just took off from there. That was a long time ago. Uh, but that, that was a lot of fun. It was just a gamble on my part and his, but there wasn't much at stake. <laughs> it was in small Iowa newspaper. Uh, Lindsay Robertson asks, what makes Boston your favorite place? What are some recommendations for books set in and about New England? Uh, well, I love Boston just for an endless number of reasons. I love its character. I love its, I used to love its seasons. I, I was belly aching about that the other day that this particular year we aren't obviously going to have an autumn. It's pretty obvious that autumn is going to stay hot and humid like summer and then immediately change to winter. And then that's happened a couple of times in the last two years where there's been no shift from the seasons where you're, you're barreling along in winter and it's cold and it's dry and then all of a sudden it's summer with no spring. 
I think that's going to happen this year. But I love the seasons. I love the walkability. I love the feel of the place. Uh, I, I love the variety. Of course, in any big city in America, the variety is, is under threat. Uh, all the big cities in America, the, the, the kind of piecemeal mom and pop variety that you used to love has been going away as real estate prices skyrocket so that places like that can't afford to be here anymore. But Boston's re retained a lot of that uh, charm, and I, I love that about it. Uh, and recommendations for books set in and about New England, well, there, there are lots and lots. Stacey Schiff's great book, The Witches on the Salem Witch Trials, uh, The Last Hurrah by Edwin O'Connor, a novel about a uh, uh, Boston political race that, where Boston is never named as the city, but it's clearly it's clearly identifiable as Boston. Or uh, Boston and Topographical History by the uh, a wonderful old gentleman who used to run the Boston Athenaeum uh, is, is a great one-volume history of Boston. There are a million, million other things. I should do a top ten. Uh, make way for ducklings, of course. Uh, there, but but there are there are many many others. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Robert Fouche. Oh, we had another question from him. He says, "How many books do you read in a year? Uh, do did you do a review of A Little Life? Do you have a place of employment?" <laughs> and you do. And he mentions that I really don't need makeup. That's very nice of you. I'm sure that's a nice way of saying no amount of makeup would help. <laughs> uh, do I, but do I have a place of employment? I have many places of employment. <laughs> I I will uh, write for anybody. Who, who wants me? Uh, if you if you know if you have a local newspaper that has region that has actual arts coverage, where they don't just take wire stories, you know, uh, from the central news agency, but that they actually have re reviewers of things. Like for instance, if you have a local newspaper that has book reviews from time to time, and you'd like to see me in it, <laughs> hook me up with their editor, and I'll make it happen. <laughs> I I have uh, uh, no scruples when it comes to that. I would like to appear everywhere. I would love to appear in your home newspaper, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, I never actually did review Hana Yanagihara's A Little Life. I wasn't quite in the game of reviewing big fiction, uh, and I could kick myself for that because, of course, it was a conversation that every critic in the world joined in on. Uh, the next big thing like that that comes down the pike, you can bet your bottom dollar I will be involved in it somehow or other. Uh, uh, of course, it helps also that I, I'm the managing editor of a literary journal, so I can, if, if I don't get anybody else to run a review, I can run one myself. Uh, and how many books do you read in a year? That changes from year to year, but it's an ungodly amount. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an ungodly amount. Last three or four years, the final number has, by my own admission, been largely unbelievable, so I've tended not to tell people. Even people who know I do nothing else but read, I've tended to leave the number out. <laughs> uh, it'll be a large amount. Uh, I, and I think this year I'm headed for a personal best, which has been true the last three years in a row. I'm hoping, anyway. Uh, Emil Ruthuth uh, says, why don't you like philosophy? Uh, I don't like it because it seems like navel-gazing. As, as an intellectual uh, endeavor, it seems like arid wordplay to me. I've almost never read uh, an, an extended work of philosophy, modern or ancient, that didn't strike me as just glorified hair splitting, as, as verbiage about nothing. Um, I could be wrong. Certainly there are a lot of smart people I know who read and love philosophy, but I just don't see it. I don't see any there there. No meat at all. Just self-referentiality self uh, raised to uh, you know a, a, a logarithmic level. That I just <laughs> I've never found uh, any, any point to it. Uh, I, maybe that's me. Uh, uh, little old lady from Moose Jaw. <laughs> what a great name. Uh, uh, Steve, besides your spidey sense, do you know when you have come across a great new writer? Who would you have liked to have known and been friends with in World War II? Have you ever been to Fiji? And if so, what did you think of it? I phrase the last question this way because I know you have never been to Oz or New Zealand, but I am unclear if this covers the whole of the SP or just those two countries. Uh, Okay, there's a lot here. I, we're going to have to do maybe four parts to this. Oh, my God. Uh, I don't know how much memory is on this phone. Uh, you, you, you asked, besides my spidey sense, do I know when I've come across a great writer? Uh, it's, it's Okay, the, the spidey sense is a big part of it because you develop instincts over time when all you do is read new books, and uh, mine are fairly well developed. I don't need much to know uh, this book is important. Uh, but if we leave that out... Uh, Two things always guide me. The first is immediate, and that's, you know, if I'm reading the first five, six, seven chapters, is this 
uh, perfectly controlled passion. Does this does this writer not only have the passion of what they want to say, but also the ability to say it? Is it under their control? And then the second is not so immediate, and that's when I'm done with it, you know, a month later, two months later, how much am I still thinking about it? And in what way? Uh, and those those can be a very good barometer of whether or not I've encountered something that really is special. And uh, I rely on those, but I have to confess, I rely more on my spidey sense, on on just, I don't even know how to describe it. It's an instinct when something comes down, down the pike. I won't say that I can tell by the title and the author, but I don't need much more than that to know whether or not a book is going to be worth serious consideration. Uh, just, just you get to know it. You get to know the characteristics of these things if you if you deal with nothing else. <laughs> uh, um, who would you like to have been known and been friends with in World War II? Actually, the odd answer to this question is I would like to have known and been friends with uh, rel no one famous relatives of friends of mine, fathers and grandfathers of friends of mine who served in the war, and also in a kind of in a kind of weird way uh, my own father. Uh, who served in the war. He, he, as a young man, it would have been nice to, to talk to him and see uh, what I might see about him before he loved reading, before he got into writing, before he had the weight of the world on his shoulders, before any of that. I, that would have been fascinating, I think. But no one famous. I, don't, I wouldn't care to meet anyone famous. Uh, have you ever been to Fiji? And if so, what did you think of it? I had been to Fiji, and I loved it, except that it was boiling hot. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I think that's why people write it's it's marquee for its beauty. Uh, uh, and it, if SP stands for South Pacific, South Pacific, I've been all over the South Pacific, uh, just no, just not to the big, uh, you know, key destinations. Uh, Sotiros Itzos says, what's your opinion of Joseph McElroy, John Barth, and William Volman? Oh my god. Okay, uh, I think the, the, the gist of what he's going at here is what's my opinion of largely, of great American authors who are largely unknown to the American reading public. I think that's the gist here, and if so, I agree completely. Uh, Joseph McElroy, in addition to a lot of other things, wrote a, a giant novel called Women and Men, which is, in my opinion, the greatest unknown American masterpiece of them all. It's, it, it ought to be reprinted. It ought to be in Penguin Classics. It ought to be taught. It ought to be known. And instead, you could go weeks at a time, even in bookish company, without meeting a single person who has even heard of it, much less read it. I think that's a terrible shame. Uh, same thing with, uh, with John Barth. I think that uh, Giles Goatboy and especially The Sotweed Factory. The Sotweed Factory is one of the great American novels of the 20th century. The only caveat that I have with Barth is that I wish... He would stop writing. I wish he had stopped writing maybe six, seven books before he did. He he uh, he kept writing even after he stopped taking it seriously. It's a it's a it's a high and serious calling. If you're doing it as some sort of crazy old man prank, you know, oh, you know me, I'm an institution here. I've got uh, the the wild you know Doc Brown way about me, and I can write whatever I want and get a, a major publisher to publish it. If you're doing that, someone ought to stop you. <laughs> Uh, that whether whether that you're Kurt Vonnegut or whether you're Joseph Heller or whether you're John Barth, I wish that someone had, but it doesn't change his earlier books, which I think I think that Letters and Tidewater Tales and Giles Goat Boy and especially The Saltweed Factor are fantastic books. I would also put in this category um, uh, John Gardner, who is is unknown now except for Grendel, and that's a shame because he wrote a lot of great books in, in addition to Grendel. And you also mentioned William Volman, and the same thing. Uh, is kind of sort of true for him. He, I think that Barth has lost control of his talent. I think that if, if I'm not quite sure if John Barth is still alive, but if he is, he's incredibly old. He's probably still planning on another book. When his last four or five, uh, to be brutal about it, are disgraces to his literary memory, uh, and shouldn't have been published. And although Volman hasn't reached that point, in fact, just recently he wrote *The Dying Grass*, a gigantic book that I thought was a masterpiece. He does write too much. He he he. Uh, He's sort of slowed a little, and I hope that continues. But there are books of his, including very long books of his, uh, that seem just uncontrolled verbiage to me. And that I think that hurts your reputation. I, I know these authors have mortgages to pay, but I wish that they would not do it. <laughs> I wish that they would be a little more controlled about it. Uh, I actually felt the same thing about Thomas Pynchon's Inherent Vice, and, and yet that book was so beloved by so many people. 
But I, I, I almost feel like the Grinch for wishing that he hadn't written it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Marcus, uh, let's see what you say. Uh, I don't know if you ever asked this, but what made you want to get into book reviewing? And do you remember what the first book you ever wrote about was? Oh, my. Well, what I, I just mentioned what, I, what made me get in, want to get into book reviewing was seeing other book reviews do it and uh, thinking... I mean, there comes a point, right? When you, when you, if you read and you read and you read, or you go to movies and you go to movies and you go to movies, or you watch TV and you watch TV and you watch TV, there comes a point when you have to start making something yourself. You have to start responding, as opposed to just absorbing. You have to, uh, or I think, and the, I reached that point, and and fortunately, I had right to hand the ability to to, to give it a try uh, for an audience of several thousand readers. Uh, and I actually don't remember what my first, the first book I ever reviewed was. I remember distinctly that the arts section editor that I submitted it to took it. So there was no, there was no, you know, rejection slip learning curve for me. The first review that I wrote, I don't remember what the book was. I think it was Epic Fantasy. Uh, but the first book review that I wrote uh, was published. And that has stayed true. So, so, so I know that. I didn't have that kind of, of learning curve. Uh, but I don't remember what the book was, no. Uh, let's see here. Gemma Hajaz, uh, I, I probably butchered your name, Hajish O'Connor. Gemma O'Connor uh, says, uh, let's see here. <laughs> I never have any questions for you. She's full of questions for me. <laughs> That's a little bit of an in-joke there. Uh, what was the name of your best friend, Mr. Beagle? <laughs> I didn't know that, that I'd mentioned him enough times for him to be remembered. Uh, how did he come to live with you? How many muscular teenagers are there? <laughs> That's a reference. Those of you who might be new to the channel to the fact that I keep company with a group of muscular weightlifters, 18 and 19 year old weightlifters. And the group size changes. Right now it's four key people and then their friends come and go. Uh, but it, can, it could go up or down from there. And I haven't seen much of them because I've been homebound 24 hours a day with the puppy. Uh, so I, I need to rectify that. And, uh, and I'll just have to figure out a way to do that. Uh, who was the man who taught you to love reading and uh, doing? What was he? What was he doing for a living? And do you have any particular memory of him that you wouldn't mind sharing? Uh, well, he was writing for a living. He was making a living by his pen, which it, it was in his particular uh, circumstances was a bit rare. Uh, uh, and I have lots and lots of memories of him. I have I have personal memories of him. I have out and about memories of him. I have memories of how he bookshopped in open air stalls and the ways that he did it. I'm afraid I may have absorbed too many of those. I'm sure, I'm sure you'd see some of them if you watched me bookshop at the Brattle. Uh, and I also have personal memories, you know, meals, conversations, late night talks, that sort of thing. Uh, all fascinating, even when they were cranky. <laughs> uh, Richardson Reads, hello, says, uh, what was it like growing up in Southie? What are your favorite Boston institutions? Well, first of all, let's keep in mind, there's no scholarly consensus that I did grow up in Southie, but it's a strong theory. <laughs> uh, and if I did, my my favorite memories are were the community. It was, it was at the time, a very close-knit, clannish community. Uh, church, school, Sunday, meals, grandparents, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it was very, very oral, very rich in, in stories and literature, and, uh, and very close-knit. And that's gone now. South Boston, most of South Boston isn't like that anymore, and that's a shame. Uh, as far as favorite Boston institutions go, well, there are a lot of them. There's uh, the Boston Public Library, which is stunningly beautiful, the old building, and I love it. I absolutely love it. And the new building was just renovated recently, and I love the new renovation. Uh, there's the Boston Athenaeum. There's my hole in the wall Chinese food restaurant, which doesn't even have a sign. <laughs> it doesn't have an English menu. <laughs> uh, there's Fenway Park, of course. There's uh, uh, the the uh, Commonwealth Mall. There's a long walk that has a, a meridian in the middle, covered, you know, canopied in trees with statues all along the way that I love to take people on. I love to walk it myself. It's a popular place for dog walkers. So I not only do I get to meditate there in peace and quiet, but I also get to meet lots of dogs. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of them. We'll go through them all when we all walk the city in SteveCon 18. Uh, Fiona Tan says, have you read uh, Zama by Antonio de Benedetto? Uh, and if yes, what did you think of it? I never have. I'm assuming from the title that it's a Roman historical novel. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up as soon as this video is over. Uh, James Holder asks, who was the worst king of England, Richard III or John or someone else? 
Are you interested in ancient history? If so, uh, any chance of a recommendation video? And finally, what is your opinion of science fiction and fantasy? I love science fiction and fantasy. Absolutely love it. Uh, I've, I've had a sweet tooth for it from the very beginning. So I, I, and I'm a big fan. Uh, uh, I do indeed have an interest in ancient history. And I'd be happy to make a recommendations video, or many more than one. And as far as the worst king of England, uh, the, for me, John and Richard were disasters in their own way. And so were a bunch of other kings. But they all had one thing in common. Uh, they valued the kingship. They valued the crown. Even if they did so for horrible personal reasons, even if they did so in a warped way, whether they thought it was warped or not. Now, my my uh, my choice for the worst king of all is the one who didn't value it, and that's Edward VIII, uh, who who abdicated in, in order to marry a woman. Gave up the crown. Gave up his responsibility. Gave up a sacred right between him and his people in order to indulge himself. In order to indulge himself in, in you know, a, a purely personal quest, uh, which is probably not going to win any sympathy in, in the 21st century. But uh, I, I look back on what he did as a just horrible betrayal of his trust that is made much worse by the fact that there's, I think there's a very strong case to be made that he would have taken his crown back again.